Um, hi everyone and welcome to the little big island of St. John, uh, Coral Bay and Fortsburg. So we are, again, as Ms. Brown mentioned, my name is Kurt Marsh Jr. I'm an architect and woodworker on St. John, uh, Vice President of St. John Co., the St. John Heritage Collective, um, and part owner of this site. Uh, uh, this site is under the uh, protection, so to speak, of the Samuel family on St. John. Uh, we've owned it for several generations now, and we have the pleasure of inviting Virgin Islanders here to what is perhaps the most critical site in the Freedom Project in the Virgin Islands historical narrative. Uh, so Fortsburg, uh, originally Fort Hill, uh, or Fort Frederick, was constructed in about 1917, 1717, uh, when the first settlements of Coral Bay and the, Coral, the Carolina Plantation uh, were established. Um, the initial fort was an earthwork or a stone breathwork structure. It's not what we see now uh, that existed on the site. It obviously, it, we're up on the top of a peninsula. Uh, it comes up sort of as a cone. And so in the site that we have, we have a full 360 view really of the entire surrounding areas and we get the entire Coral Bay Harbor. And obviously a fort is meant to protect space. And so this gives a really great vantage point of the surrounding area and plantation establishments that would have needed to be protected. Uh, so as I was saying, the initial structure was a stone breathwork structure that was built in 1717. Uh, as we all know or should know, the revolution of 1733 took place on St. John in Coral Bay and this site is attributed most directly to that revolution, uh, which started at uh, the Carolina plantation, which is just uh, to our west uh, down in the Coral Bay Valley, the Carolina Valley. Uh, and it was initiated by, according to historic record, uh, St. John's Queen, Brefu, and some other slaves who organized and came together to plot the first successful revolution of an enslaved people in the Western Hemisphere. So this is Western Hemisphere history, not just a St. John story. And so it's important to remember that as we talk about spaces and historic narratives, at any rate, Queen Brefu and uh, her, her cohorts moved from the Carolina plantation up here to Fortsburg. They carried uh, the weapons in their sticks, their bundles of sticks as they came to the site, uh, so as for it to be incognito. And they came up here, took over the site, uh, and then the revolution spread across the entire the entirety of St. John, all the way to the Durlu Plantation, which is now the Canil Bay Plantation, where the bulk of some of the massacres and, and larger scale events of the revolution took place. Uh, at any rate, after the revolution occurred in 1733, um, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, the Akwamu, believed to be descendants of the Akwamu tribes in Africa, held St. John for a period of six months before the Danish got help from the government in Martinique, who sent French soldiers to help them reclaim the space. And so they were able to out uh, the fire that was the revolution and reclaim St. John. Many of the slaves either fled to the BVIs or even in some cases to St. Croix for freedom. Uh, and some uh, uh, legend says jumped to their deaths off of some of the cliffs around on St. John. But I want to take a minute to talk about the architecture for a bit, because what we're standing in now is the renovated fort um, pre-1733 revolution. So the fort was rebuilt in 1760. And so this, this is what we're experiencing now, the ramparts of the adjusted fort um, that was built. Obviously, the Danes recognized that the establishment that existed here before wasn't sufficient enough to properly guard and protect uh, the planters, uh, specifically the planters, because, you know, the slaves were so easily, the enslaved Africans were, were very um, uh, capable as they were able to overthrow the establishment. But so we have typical uh, masonry construction that we see in most of, of all the plantation ruins across the territory. Uh, if we step over here, we can see all of the rubble stonework and all the lime mortar in between we have our brick uh, uh our rows of brick in between there's a variation of red brick and yellow brick 
if we're aware the yellow brick came over in the Danish ships uh, as a means to help you know, weigh, control the weight of the ship as they were moving. And so as the ships came and offloaded slaves and all of that, they would offload the bricks as well that ended up becoming construction material. And so we see them all across our downtown, especially our downtown historic districts and in all of the, many of the plantation ruins, if not all of them. And so over, this is an interesting area of the site. First, let me lay out this, the ruin and then I'll get into detail. So right now we're at the entry of the fort, which is the south, southern face. And the fort is a rectangle, a rectangular shape. It's about, uh, what is it? I think about 50 feet by 110 feet or so. So it's not a huge establishment. Uh, the walls are about two, two and a half, three feet thick. Uh, this center er central area here would have been the, the captain's quarters. And so it's raised up on a stonemasonry base, also a typical feature of colonial architecture stonemasonry base and there are remnants of what looks to be a wood frame structure um, or speak to what would have been a wood frame structure on the center and so there's a staircase buried somewhere in the dirt here that would lead you up into this captain's quarter here and there would have been that additional wood, wood frame structure on top and so that's obviously where the command center for the establishment was. But although it's a rectangular shape, each of the corners juts out to form what we see typically, the, you know, that little dime, triangle, triangular or diamond uh, form at the corners of the site. And those became additional rooms. So there might have been a storage room in one corner, um, some sort of uh, a pantry in the other, might have been, you know, a staging area in another. But if you look out over here, some, most people might think this is an oven because the walls look charred. But if I were to guess, and this is not something that's been proven as yet, but if I were to guess, I might say that this is where they stored the gunpowder for the cannons. Because of course, it's a fort and it's for protection. So that means there were cannons here that were active at one point. And so this might just be the remnants of the gunpowder that would have been stored in here to supply the cannons, which would have been up on the parapets around the perimeter of the structure. And so I think it's really important when we have conversations about uh, historic spaces and architecture uh, to note that although these plantation sites were built or commissioned by Denmark and the Danish rule at the time, a lot of what we see is African masonry ingenuity and, and um, excellence. Because uh, whereas, you know, we look at these structures and they are Danish by design, they really, for all intensive purposes, are African by construction, which is a part of why historic record would tell us, which is a part of what, the reason why African slaves from that very particular part of West Africa were brought here during the establishment of the Plantation Society because they were master masons and they wanted to take advantage, the Danes wanted to take advantage of that skill set. And so while, you know, there's a fantastic irony that these structures are monuments to slavery and a very traumatic time for descendants of, of slaves, they also stand as testament to, um, you know, the skill uh, and ingenuity of of the African. And so while there's trouble, <laughs> there's struggle with, you know, ac appreciating these spaces, um, there's also the desire to celebrate them because they speak about us uh, um, in, in, in profound ways, according to the architecture and the construction, as much as they speak to the very traumatic experience of slavery. Uh, but I'm honored to be a part of the legacy of this space, not only as a child of the diaspora and of slavery on St. John, uh, but also in the present day, you know, my family, uh, as I mentioned before, we have owned the property here for several generations and we have the very amazing opportunity to procure this space for the people of the Virgin Islands for interpretation, which is critical 
um, as we talk about how we as Virgin Islanders appreciate and interpret and celebrate space because it's important to note that all of these plantation ruins you know they don't just stand as monuments to the trauma of slavery they also stand as monuments to the skill and capacity of our ancestors and so it's critical for us to exercise whatever will and right that we can to maintain these spaces and to make them accessible and to bring people to them to open opportunities for interpretation so if you're unaware uh, there's an annual tour to Fortsburg every year um, that where we commemorate the 1733 revolution uh, associated with, uh, per, as per Virgin Islands Code, Freedom Fighters Day, which is November 23rd of every year. So if you didn't know, now you know, and we should celebrate the revolution. Uh, but it's an amazing thing to, like I said, be able to procure this space and to, to create opportunities for interpretation because especially on St. John, where um, the narratives around historic spaces have been hijacked by, you know, the National Park as they own most of the historic ruins on island. And the story of the National Park really start, it, it has amazing gaps. It talks about slavery, then emancipation, then there's a big wide chasm of space and then Lawrence Rockefeller shows up and establishes the park and everybody loves it and celebrates it. But there was a period in between then where you know, these sites were owned and some of them operated by uh, the, who would be the ancestors of, you know, current St. Julian descendants. Myself, for example, and many others, uh, you know, the Carolina Plantation, my great, great grandfather, uh, William Marsh, was <laughs> distilling during Prohibition. So we have some of these sites have been very active. Uh, if you go to the Reef Bale Plantation, you'd see the great house and the ruins and he's buried on site. Um, and, you know, even in Reef Bay, they were still distilling. The factories were active well up until, you know, the 30s or so. And so we have long legacies in these spaces outside of slavery and the plantocracy where St. Julian's had ownership and maintained these spaces. And so I think it's very important that when we still have opportunities, as in Fortsburg, to control how we're able to interpret those spaces, we make sure that we create opportunities to tell the full story. And so the, the, the Fortsburg site and many others on St. John are really critical to that, especially as St. John is continually seized and consumed by you know, forces outside of St. John that would seek to you know, diminish what would be the ancestral native story on the island. And so I appreciate Ms. Brown and the Division of Cultural Education for giving an opportunity to speak some of that truth to the other parts of the historic narrative, especially on St. John, as I said, because it's so critical that the, the, the ancestral native story here continues to be told uh, because we don't have very many opportunities for that. And very many of the persons that seek to tell historic narratives of St. John seek to celebrate the park and the establishment of the park. And so the story kind of starts from the 1960s come forward when there was a whole period of time in between where St. Jonians owned and operated and flourished and thrived in our space, unlike many of the ways we see now. And so if I, want, if I could take a minute just to talk about what the, uh, the future visioning of this space could look like, you know, because as a young architect and contemporary designer, of course, I'd like to see opportunities where the space comes back to life. And so uh, in my capacity on the family uh, uh, corporation, we're moving to try to do just that. We're establishing uh, parameters by which we figure out how we want to make the space accessible so that persons can enjoy the space on a much more routine basis outside of the 1733 commemorative tour that happens annually. But what would it mean to have this site clear? What would it mean to be able to walk you know, around this central piece of architecture and to get to touch and feel all of the stonework, to get to see the layers of construction as it were, to get to point out spaces and see where there might have been a renovation. If we see here, this is all room for interpretation uh, at the architectural level. But then what, is, what would it mean if we could do archeological studies and be able to dig up some of the soil and find artifacts that speak to 
how the site might have been used outside of um, it being a garrison. Uh, for example, where there are deposits in several areas of the site where there are shells. And so obviously we know most times when we find those deposits, they were dumps for ovens. And so there might have been an oven nearby. And so what if we could dig up the foundation of an oven and move, dig through those pits in an archaeological study and find some cheney or some glass or things like that that speak to other ways the space might have been used because as far as the narrative tells us now it's confined to just the fort so our interpretation of this space is just the walls of this fort but what if we were to explore all the rest of the site and to get to gather that information and disseminate it and study it so that we can expand the narrative beyond the walls of the fort itself you know and so we're engaging in these conversations at the familiar at the level uh, across the family and of course we're in conversation with government entities that could supply support and things like that but imagine you know being able to come to this space and it's alive because right now there's life here there's life because we know the sanctity of the space and we understand the history of the space and we respect you know the ancestors that were that fought to be able to give us the opportunity to claim this space right but what would it be to come into this space in a contemporary age and it has new life and there's room for interpretation? What would it be to erect a monument to the 1733 revolution? And so there's a, a, a celebratory level of interpretation as well, rather than just coming to a space that's renewed. We put the walls back up. We, you know, uh, 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 adjust some of the masonry, things like that. But opportunities for interpretation and celebration of self because obviously all these conversations come back to Virgin Islanders, understanding who they are, understanding where they come from, and spaces like this help us to do that. The space is well, the narrative of the space goes well beyond it being a Danish establishment to protect the harbor. It also is a monument, as I said before, to African ingenuity. It's a testament to the Freedom Project uh, in, in that uh, St. Julian's now own the space and it's really a legacy project. You know, it gives us the uh, opportunity to tell the story, a more full story from our perspective uh, and put it out into the world for interpretation. How did your family come into the property? Because would you say that they may have been, some of your ancestors may have been enslaved on this property as well or nearby properties and how uh, how does how does um, enslavement intertwine in now having some autonomy over your own body and having property? Mm. So I have two great aunts that uh, they laud the I, the idea that we descend the Samuels and Saint John descend from uh, members of the Aquamu tribe, um, and so they laud that we are royalty um, you know and so that we participated in the revolution and all that because obviously you come from a place with a, with a certain caliber in society to be a slave in another man's land you'd fight and resist um, and so they <laughs> they tease all the time and, and say they they strongly believe that we descend from some of the members of the revolution um, I have no confirmation of it but it's a beautiful thing to think that uh, because we, I'm doing a whole lot of genealogical research right now where I'm trying to tap into a lot of the narratives. Um, fortunately, unfortunate, I'm a, I'm, I come from all the deepest rooted families on St. John, so my web is vast. Well, oral tradition is very, it, has <laughs> it a is. Lot of validity. Oh, and it's been, in doing all the current research, it's been amazing to be able to verify things that I've heard here and there. Uh, uh, against things that are written. For example, I've always heard that, because I'm a sewer from, say, from East End, I've always heard that we have been on St. John a long, long time through you know, oral history, but only very recently I got access to information that showed that the sewers were actually Creole people on St. John before slavery showed up. And so we have, you know, well over 300 years of ancestry here as free people you know 
And so there's this very beautiful dynamic as we're able to come to space and interpret space and confirm with historic record against oral history. And I think that's how, that's how the exercise should work, right? It's all a process of verification and research and, and studying. And you, you sit with your elders and you get these stories and all of those things so that you put things together and you confirm because, you know, they say the story of the, the hunter, right? The lion, we never, hear, we never hear how much the lion thrived in the fight. We only hear about the hunter because the hunter survives, right? And so on St. John and in most of the West, the story, the narrative often revolves around the planter and the plantation society. And so this narrative of the slave oftentimes gets left out. And so that's why, especially in our society, oral tradition is so important because where we might not find record of things in books, stories are passed on generation to generation and you know there's always room for interpretation and fact finding but that's been a way that we've kept stories and kept a uh, legacy going for millennia this is this is tra african tradition you know and so i think uh just to go back to your point um it's a beautiful it, it's my aunts again believe that we descended from uh members of the Akwamu tribe and were our descendants of persons who participated in the revolution. And the beautiful thing about that is that that really compounds this need to preserve space on St. John, especially for St. Junians. It compounds this desire to want to make this space open and available and accessible to all Virgin Islanders to interpret because we know that all of the Virgin Islands are very interconnected in many spaces through time. For example, St. Croix, Ayai, didn't become a part of the Virgin Islands until after the revolution because the Denmark, Denmark needed to recuperate from all the losses of the revolution on St. John. And so the following year, uh, St. Croix was purchased because the plantations there were thriving. And so it, it then became a part of the, what was the Danish West Indies. And a lot of the people, as I said before in my, uh, my narrative, a lot of the folks who fled after the revolution, fled captivity, migrated to St. Croix and the BVI. And so there's this interconnectivity of St. Jonian and Crucian roots, you know, from for the last few centuries, well beyond, you know, the current United States Virgin Islands story. And so it's important that we, these spaces are available for that interpretation and to connect all of those dots across the board. You also mentioned, sir, the importance of young persons having conversations, intergenerational conversations uh, with their, the elders in their family. Um, like, can you touch on that and reiterate the importance since we are talking to students in our um, <laughs> public school system? So uh, my initial interest in any type of history came from sitting at my grandfather's uh, knee or my grandmother's knee. A uh, good time for me growing up was spending the weekend by my grandma baking tart and cake, uh, which is a headache for me now because my aunts always call me for recipes. <laughs> <laughs> or, or my grandfather, I could do kalaloo and thing because I watched my grandfather cook it uh, coming up. So my love for our culture stemmed really early on from you know just being a part of the the day-to-day -day activity of my elders um, and in all of that there would be stories about their growing up and coming into their own and how they experience you know uh, life on St. John or life with their parents there's a wonderful wonderful array of knowledge and, and uh, learning that you could get just from speaking with your elders you know uh, sit with grandma when she's in her rocking chair and ask her you know, about life at a certain point in time. You never know, the stories could go in all kinds of ways. There could be a million tangents. You could start with asking her what her favorite candy was growing up and that might take her on a wild story about where she used to go to get candy and maybe uh, uh, um, who made the best candy. And uh, th There's so much beauty in just conversation with our elders um, and I learned I was fortunate enough to learn that early on 
And in just sitting with them and having these conversations very routinely, very regularly, it opened my eyes up, uh, opened my mind up to a lot of the uh, uh, historic narrative of St. John beyond what we may learn in school, which is not much, unfortunately, or what the park uh, tells us on the, the few plaques that they do have throughout um, the park network on St. John. So it, it led me to know that I should be proud, especially as a ancestral land owner on St. John, I should be proud of the story and the legacy of our land ownership. Um, you know, whether it's the sewers in owning land in East End as Creole, free Creole people before slavery, back in the 1600s, or uh, the, my, my surname, which is Marsh, owning lands, you know, from the early 1800s. So it gives you the, a very clear picture about, of self. I learned early on that uh, the, the oral history and oral tradition really teaches you about who you are. Um, and I think Virgin Islanders have been dancing with this identity crisis for a very long time. And so getting the richness of those stories and being able to feel it, because that's really what happens. You sit and you speak with your elders and you feel what they're saying. Uh, in many cases, they're very nostalgic. They're very saddened by the way our society is now. And so there's an opportunity to to sit with them and feel, um, you know, what they're saying. Uh, and then in that feeling, as we move through that feeling, explore, you know, try to go out and find the fruit that they spoke about, uh, go find a book. I know libraries are hard to come by lately, but <laughs> we have resources here and there to find a book, read about a Virgin Islands history. Um, there's the genealogy lab. Uh, the the access the resources that we could tap into that really give us you know uh, a full breadth of who we are where we come from and things like that. Go walk through your historic towns, you know your historic districts. Go and look at the architecture. Go and see how you you know our West Indian traditional cottages with the stone masonry base and the wood frame construction above. Go and look at some of the old warehouses, the old Danish warehouses that are these massive two and three story structures lined in the streets of our downtown and interpret that, you know, explore it, take pictures, uh, go home, have conversations again with your family, with your elders, have conversations with your friends. You'd be amazed where, what rabbit hole you could, you know, go down in exploring Virgin Islands history because there's so much about the story that we don't get in school. And it's really a beautiful thing once we start to open ourselves to all of that further interpretation and history. You are an architect uh, uh, through your um, academic uh, studies. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell our students some about of the career opportunities they can have in architecture, in preservation, both on land and on marine environments? Uh, Actually, you know, what's surprising is, um, and I'm hoping that somewhere along the lines, maybe UVI would get hip to it. Uh, and if they don't, I know there's the uh, development right now of a Virgin Islands architecture school uh, out of St. Croix, and there's uh, intentions for one in St. Thomas as well. But there are very many opportunities. Some of them don't currently exist because we don't have structures in place to support them. For example, uh, there'd be an amazing career. Uh, anyone could have an amazing career as a historic architect in the Virgin Islands because there's no shortage of historic structures that need restoration, that need studying and interpretation. Um, but like I said, the, the infrastructure isn't in place for it. But the, beyond uh, the historic architecture and interpretation, there's room for, uh, and that's just at the research level, there's room to be an architect that specifically deals with renovation of historic properties, right? Or you can be an architect who deals with reconstruction of historic properties, or it could go beyond architecture. You could be a contractor and a builder who focuses on renovations and restorations. And so you build a very unique and particular skill set to be able to handle the many challenges that, you know, these types of historic structures pose. But you, there, there are fantastic opportunities just to be able to move in that space, um, whether it's as the architect, as the historian, as the builder, 
or you know, as the docent in the museum or library, as the curator of the museum and library. There are many, many opportunities, uh, I think, for careers. Since we're in a historic space, uh, speaking about uh, that context, very many beautiful experiential opportunities to, be in, in, to move in, in historic spaces and reinterpret them, bring them back to life, uh, uh, renovate them and the like. I'm a contemporary architect, and so while I appreciate opportunities to restore spaces and bring them back to life, um, I'm also a preservationist. So the buildings I like to design new from the ground up, I want to have you know, all the coolest, newest features, but then historic structures I'd love to see preserved as they were, because that's how we interpret them. <laughs>